All right, let us get started here. So, I see that there are, amazingly enough, a few people here. Um, so that's good. So uh, a few words about um, uh, logistics and so forth, um, or procedures, I should say. Uh, if you, we found uh, one or two glitches in the um, test suite, and when we do that, we simply rerun everything. Uh, you don't get penalized, obviously, because your things get rerun, because your, the lateness is counted from the time of submission, not from the time the grader runs. So um, if you have a question about, gee, something went wrong, I'm going to resubmit, feel free to resubmit. You can always email us later and say, please remove such and such a submission, and we can do that, and that will, um, then it, you know, it doesn't get counted. Um, we can redo that, we can do that, and then rerun the test for you. Uh, so don't, um, and if you receive multiple copies of the test, don't be terribly surprised. In particular, I think I'm going to do another run at some point where in assessing test coverage, I filter out um, some of your tests because some of you are confusing matters by copying tests that you got from the auto grader. Uh, and those should not be counted as your tests. Um, in fact, I think I'll establish a procedure in the future where I have a, a, a subdirectory, where I specify a subdirectory where you can put tests that are, um, where you can put tests from other sources and you can put anything you want in there with, uh, without, fear of, um, without fear of being accused of plagiarism, just copyright violation. So, um, <clears throat> but I haven't done that, so. Not this time. Okay, uh, let me see what else. Um, um, yeah, all right. So those are, that's the that's the main thing. Um, <coughs> and uh, other than that, remember that we are having an in-class test uh, next Wednesday. So if you have problems with specific things, you know, items, please bug submit them. Don't post them because that because there's this welter of posts that we get. Although I, for some reason I think it's slacking off now. Hmm, I wonder why. Um, so, but but do bug submit them, and we will that will, then we can deal with them in an orderly fashion. Um, now, if there are any, um, and in particular, if you've got any, you can you can just send me ordinary email if you have a specific question about. Um, you know, is, is this uh, um, something along the lines of can you do that? Can you make the auto grader do this or something like that? Or is this, or this auto grader test appears to be, uh, no, not that one, don't do that. But uh, um, uh, is, this, is this really wrong? Should I submit another, should I submit another project? Probably the best way to answer that is just say yes and do it and then if it turns out to be unnecessary, we can, we can deal with it later. Okay, uh, so that's that. Other administrative questions or whatever about the project or other materials? Okay. Um, all right, and okay, so in that case, let's uh, just carry on with the material here. Uh, I, we had started talking about um, these coercion thingies. So, um, where does this fit in? Okay, how, why, why, where does this come from? So earlier, in the previous uh, uh, um, section or previous slide, whatever, we've been talking about subtypes. X is a subtype of Y. And in the early days, um, the notion of, there wasn't really a clear notion of subtypes, but there was this notion that some things ought to be used semi-interchangeably. So for example, it's just a real pain uh, in Fortran uh, or, some li or languages like that to remember that um, X is a floating point type and, uh, and one is an integer literal and so maybe you should, one should be converted before um, assigning into X. So that was considered a pain because in mathematics, you, when, you're doing, uh, when you're doing normal uh, mathematics, and you're not being, and you're not doing something like uh, uh, 
universe or algebra or whatever, where you make, where you have to make constant distinctions between um, between exactly what domain you're dealing in, uh, you treat the integers as just a part of the of the of the real numbers, and so you uh, so writing that coercion just doesn't make any sense from a from the technical point of view. So um, there are these rules for saying when you could use something in place of another silently, when you could automatically convert things from one thing to another when the meaning was clear. So um, thus, in Java, you can write those things that you see there. Even though x, even though c is of type character, it is nevertheless defined as a kind, as an integral type. That is to say, each character corresponds to some ASCII code, and uh, there is a, a clear uh, relationship between the two. But um, we don't, it's wrong to call this, uh, we, we, this is not generally what we refer to as subtyping um, for a number of reasons, uh, basically at all levels. I mean, the set of operations on floating point numbers, for example, is different from the set of operations on integers. When you say plus on a floating point number, you get a much different operation from when you say plus on an integer, or more especially when you do a, a, a divide on a floating point number, you get a much different operation from the, from the same operation on integers. So calling integers a subtype of floating point is extreme, would, would be, no, that would be very misleading. So these are two related types, and there happen to be a number of co conversions defined between them. That's all. So, um, and you know, when these, especially when these, uh, well, the, the, term, the term that's been used for conversion between um, related types or conceptually related types is coercion in enforcing one to the other, especially in the context, especially when it's implicit, as in these cases. So um, uh, the problem, however, is that it's not very pure. I mean, in a pure subtyping in, in Java, for example, if I, if I define, if I assign uh, something of type string to something of type object, I lose no information. So it, it, the thing is still a string. I can fa find that out if I, in principle by asking, uh, by asking if it's an instance of string or by using the dot class operation. So um, I haven't lost any information. But when you go, but in this case, uh, that's, not, that's not true. For example, when I say float y equals x, in Java, float is a 32-bit floating point number, which means that it has a 24-bit significant. So only 24 bits of your 32-bit integer actually get transferred. The top, uh, the most significant um, uh, 24 bits actually get transferred to the, um, to the uh, floating point number. Right, just a moment. Let me make sure I've got that right. Okay, so it's, 23 bits, one is implicit, and then, okay. Yes, um, sorry, I just remembering the IEEE fo uh, format there. So uh, that's, even though that's a conversion, it can lose information. So it isn't, it's a sort of a dicey thing to do, usually okay, but it is kind of a dicey thing to do. Um, so uh, generally speaking, Java, um, limits these coercions to cases that don't egregiously lose information. So it, for historical reasons maybe, or something else, or for convenience, it allows float y equals x, even though they can lose information, but it doesn't allow things the other way around. Um, so uh, these are called uh, coercions that can lose information, ostensibly lose information, are called narrowing co coercions. Um, and in general, the Java rule, not the Fortran rule, but the Java rule is that they must be explicit. You have to write them out. If you're going to lose information, you've got to explicitly say, I intend to lose information at this point. Trust me, just do it, right? And stop complaining, you stupid compiler. That's what it means. Um, so uh, in Fortran, um, so again, int, we, we, even though int to float can lose information, in fact, you can lose information going in either direction, um, <coughs> even though that's, a, uh, that's, that's, that's still allowed um, historically because you can assign from, you say you, uh, people often use integer literals as floating point numbers. Um, okay, so uh, what we get is, I think I have an example. Yes, here we are. 
So, and this is again Java, we uh, allow things like x equals y and a equals b because those aren't losing any information, but we disallow the inverse coercions implicitly. We require them to be explicit. Um, namely, um, what is that funny notation? I don't know. It, these th this thing is an error because uh, y equals x is an error in this slide because uh, y is a string and x might not necessarily, uh, y is a type string, x might not, not necessarily contain a string. So this might actually be an error. So it, allow, it requires you to be explicit about it. Likewise, b equals a. Well, a may contain a number that's larger than um, the outside the range of shorts, which are from positive, which are from um, uh, plus 2 to the 15th minus 1 down to negative 2 to the 15th. So um, what are you supposed to do in that case? Well, if you explicitly ask that it be done, um, then uh, by saying b equals short of a, then the Java will say, okay, fine, I'll just take this, sh I'll just take this integer um, modulo 2 to the 16th and give you, uh, um, in, in, and, and then uh, uh, centered for sign, and I'll give you that result. Um, then uh, we have a couple of, so these examples, the last three examples are okay, those are explicit coercions, but they might lose the information or raise, uh, raise exceptions. So this is just, so that's just the concept of coercion um, and uh, um, implicit coercion. It's just, this, it's just another language thing that we have. If you want a really complicated system, um, Algol 68 was one example. C++ is a, an example of, uh, if you look at all the coercion rules, it's really a bit complicated. That's because they have to distinguish between const pointers and non-const pointers. Um, they have to distinguish between um, uh, the context in which uh, certain um, coercions are, are applied depending on where exactly the thing appears. It's, 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 it, gets pretty, it gets pretty hairy. And it's all because, and the reason for introducing these things is all because if you don't introduce them, then the, the language rules the type rules would require you to write a lot of coercions like that, and uh, where that gets where that gets common and annoying, language designers tend to put in coercions. All right, so um, now we're going to go to something. All right, I should have a blank slide or something like that, uh, saying a change with a change, a complete change in topic. So I was just finishing up yesterday's topic, and now we're going to get into a. Um, one of these, uh, a somewhat more fun topic. It's a fun topic. It is unfortunately not applicable to our project. So this is uh, one of these little things that everyone should know about, but um, I didn't happen to have a project on it this year. I used to actually have the project do this, but not, but not now. So um, this is um, um, an interesting question. I mean, we, I, I, I referred earlier to the type wars. That is um, the, between dynamic typing and static typing, um, and <laughs> and I referred to the earlier days, the prehistoric days of before 19, uh, roughly before 1970, before the late 60s, where um, the nece necessity of specifying a type was somewhat of an imposition, or seen as something as an, of an imposition. You were just humoring the poor, stupid compiler with this. Uh, but it was inconvenient for the human. Well, the truth, as usual, probably lies somewhere in between. And one of the things that you can do is uh, sort of extend the notion, still have static typing, but uh, lessen the requirement for actually being explicit about it by having the compiler um, actually figure out what the types of things may must be depending on uh, how you use them. This is called type inference, and it has um, a number of it has a number of rather interesting implications. Uh, for example, well, it, it it can actually be applied to um, to a certain extent. It can be applied to languages like JavaScript, so that you can have tools that check that that uh, that things are okay, that things are going to work. Um, 
It's not possible to do it in general. The language isn't really designed for that, but you can do it in some cases. So um, uh, what we're going to do is just talk a little bit about, first of all, how one describes type rules of a language formally, or how one might describe type rules of a language formally, and how one might use that description to figure out, when programmer writes something, to figure out what the types of the uh, variables are that he has. So, um, but before we can get to that, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, formalism. Um, so the usual, uh, the usual formalisms that we use rely ultimately on these formulas, like, like the, or these statements like this. If something is, if some hypothesis is true, then some conclusion follows. We have a bunch of rules having that form. This is true. This has type X if the following things are true. So if A and 1, E and 2 have certain types, then E2 has a certain type. As for example, if E1 and E2, um, uh, if E1 and E2, then what? Then E3 has a certain type, yes. So E1 and E2 might have type int. And we might say if E1 and E2 have type int, then E1 plus E2 has type int. Something like that. That's a, an example of a type inference rule. Um, and uh, if you, after a while, you can get to the point where you read these things that are uh, students in, computer, in theoretical, in uh, programming semantics and related uh, studies um, learn this kind of thing, and we torture them with it in uh, preliminary, or in qualifying exams, um, or preliminary exams, I mean. But uh, it's, it's something that you can, with a certain amount of practice, read. Um, and you can even take some of these rules and translate them into programs and do things with them. And not because I can really get you to do this for real, but because it's kind of fun, um, I, at this point in the course, do something rather idiosyncratic from the point of view of my colleagues. And I just say, well, what a wonderful opportunity to introduce a new programming language. Um, one that is not usually introduced in this context, uh, but I'll do it. And so you can have the idiosyncratic Killfinger presentation of um, these kind of inference things. I'm doing it basically because since we aren't going to be doing a project of this, I should try to make it fun. Otherwise, these days, the way students are, they don't never learn the thing. So I'll try to make it a little fun and by teaching you a new, a new programming language. Of course, you'll like that, right? There's nothing more wonderful in the world than learning a new programming language, right? Right? Right. OK, good. So. Um, Back in the 70s, uh, there were various attempts to write these um, languages for describing inference systems. There was something called Planner, for example, that came out of MIT. Uh, and the idea was that you, you would be able to um, uh, provide a set of axioms, if you will, and then ask a question, and the thing would basically prove a theorem. It would, it would figure out whether you can infer the answer to your question from the rules that had been given. Um, now, one application of this, there was a group in Europe who were applying this to um, basically to language processing, formal language processing, where by which I mean not natural language, not programming languages. So what they wanted to do was to be able to um, uh, recognize um, English sentences or something like that, <coughs> and, to f and to extract from them their meaning, their semantics, just as we do for programming languages. But the problem with English is, of course, it's ambiguous and it has all these various things. So they had this. So they came up with this uh, um, uh, a programming language for doing this, which, which turns out to be a general purpose, um, a semi-general purpose uh, uh, inference language. So what we call a logic programming language. Now, I, I, I say here, you saw this in CS, uh, CS61A, I, I don't, in some versions of CS61A. There was a, there was a, a section on declarative programming. Um, but it was somewhat 
CS61A idiosyncratic in its own way. So in this language, the basic idea of the language is that you write these little rules that have that form. Conclusion uh, is a bunch of, uh, conclusion follows from a bunch of hypotheses. Uh, there can be zero hypotheses, in which case you just say conclusion is true. Um, and that means, um, uh, and that means basically that given that those hypotheses, that means if you want to prove the conclusion, to demonstrate the conclusion, then demonstrate these hypotheses. That's basically what it means. Um, and so we have a bunch of, so these hypotheses and conclusions are, um, are a bunch of, uh, basically, are built up out of terms. So you have, it's very much like Lisp. You have symbols, you have um, uh, various parentheses, except it's prefix form. The parenthesis comes after the, the function name, not before it. And you have commas. So you have these, these symbols that can stand for themselves. You have uppercase symbols or um, underscore symbols, which are essentially variables. They, vary, they, um, they range over possible terms. Um, and uh, we have, in general, what the uh, sort of basic um, thing you're working with are structures of this form, where you have some symbol and a bunch of terms. Um, and that's sort of the data structure. You can, and as you know from 61A, with that data structure, given the recursive definition, uh, given a, a term of, that this is a term, and given the recursive definition of terms, you can use these things to represent just about anything, sets, sets, trees, lists, all that sort of thing, by just making use of the, by making use of the definition. So that's sort of what you deal with here. And um, these same thing, we can reuse, just as we do in Scheme, we can reuse these um, terms like this to stand for hypotheses and um, to stand for hypotheses as well and relations in general. So um, basically we all, we, and, and for convenience, we will shorten some of these so you don't have to write things. For example, the official way of writing a list is, uh, the official way of writing a list is that you have dot. Dot stands for cons. So dot, uh, so if you want a list of A, B, C, you have the cons of A and, uh, with the cons of B with the cons of C with the empty list. Boy, does that sound familiar? Right, this is, that's, that's what you get. And, and uh, basically we introduce a sugaring notation so you can just say bracket A, B, C. And, uh, um, and if you want uh, the list to continue, you can say uh, A, B, C followed by a whole, by, followed by another list. All right, so here's the idea. We start out with some, we start out with some ground um, uh, facts. I think everything on this slide is in fact a fact. <laughs> so uh, to express the fact, to, to express the fact that Brian likes pot stickers, I might, I might ima uh, imagine a predicate, introduce a predicate, likes, and just have a, uh, a rule that I add to my database of rules that says that Brian likes pot, pot stickers. Now, um, well, this second one may not, this second one is not exactly a fact, but you, it's an exaggeration, an exaggerated fact. So if I say, if I add a rule of the form uh, Brian eats X, where X is a, a variable, then that, since that form matches um, any substitution for X, this, it's, a, it's a sort of a way of saying that Brian eats anything, um, which is probably not quite right. It's more likely that he eats things only if he likes the, if they're food and he likes them. All right. So um, this is uh, so I can write that as um, it is a fact that Brian eats X if it is a fact that X is a food and it is a fact that Brian eats X. So you put together a collection of these things and you have a prologue program, or at least the beginnings of one. 
And what you can at that point do is uh, ask, is give input to the question, to the pro program in the form of queries. And the program will then answer you. Now, um, so for example, here's an example of why I'm introducing this now in this course. I can write using this notation, I can write um, uh, that type E1, that the type of E1 plus E2 of the term E1 plus E2, where E1 and A2 are any terms or any variables, um, is uh, int, assuming that the type of E1 and E2 are both int. I can write that as a rule. So for any substitution of um, for E1 and E2, if I can prove the things on the right, the thing on the left is true. And I could prove, for example, that uh, all integer int literals have type int, so I say something like type of x is int if, um, and then I have some, prim this is a primitive uh, term, sort of a cheating term that, um, uh, uh, that, that looks at the term x, looks at whatever you've put in place of x and tells you whether it is an integer, in fact, uh, whether it is an integer literal. Um, and uh, so in general, what we can do is define, what we're going to do is define this type of predicate to take a, a term and a type and to be true if, in fact, the type, um, if, in fact, the uh, uh, the term has that type. That's the idea. So we'll have a database of, of facts about types, and then uh, you can imagine the compiler coming along and asking this database, what is the type of this, or does this have the, have the type int, or even, as we'll see, what is the type of this? Now, normally, um, let me hasten to say that if you were to go into the, lit into the um, type literature, you would find that the notation doesn't look like this. The notation instead, just in case you're curious, ooh, somebody has big chalk, which they are not supposed to have. In case you're curious, the notation looks more like, um, you see things like this, some set of rules, from some set of rules, um, deduce that, uh, that X has type T. That's the usual notation with the, these turnstiles called sequent notation with these turnstiles and things. But that's not where, how we're going to do But But that looks too much like mathematics and there's this temptation to introduce Greek letters and all that sort of thing. It makes it confusing. And besides, it doesn't have a programming language uh, compiler to go along with it, and this does. So I'm going to do it this way. Right. Uh, so as long as you remember, as long as you keep that in mind so that you don't show off your notation in front of Professor Bodick and do it in prologue, and he looks at you strangely and says, please get out of my office. Uh, just, I'll, I'm just warning you of that in, in advance. All right, um, I'm going to do a little demonstration of this, but after we take a brief break. So um, are there questions so far? I haven't really done anything, but maybe the notation is confusing or something. Okay, fine, let's uh, take a break and then come back. Yes. Auto grid is supposed to send out actual results. The stuff you're talking to people, it seems like other groups got uh, actual results after the night last night. Uh -huh. uh, yes, it did send out results. We got emails from previous submissions, but we didn't get an email. Okay, well, you send me a bug submit, and I'll look into it.
much better, I think. Yes? Hi, um, for the autograder emails, we were just wondering what the warnings on the bottom mean. Sorry, I can't, I can't read those. What does Sorry. it say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, just tell me what they're saying. Oh, this is parsing errors? Although all the tests run and um, are That means that, um, okay, so that those are presumably your tests that for some reason um, our compiler thinks are syntactically incorrect. Oh. For some reason. But they still pass the make checks or? Well, yes, because your compiler doesn't consider oh, them illegal. Okay. I see. So okay. what, what we did was we ran our compiler over all of your tests uh -huh. to see how much of the syntax you covered. Okay. And that was, you know, according to us. Okay. So, oh, yeah. okay. Is this something that we need to fix? Or? Uh, well, you might consider it. Uh, I mean, it, you might look at those and see if you really think that there are um, errors. It might be that it might be that there are errors that we are not doing something that we should be doing. In which case, you should probably bug some of it because maybe you're failing a test because we think that that's a syntax that we're, uh, we think it should be a syntax error and you don't or something. I don't know. Um, how about success definition? All right. and all of our tests, just those warnings. Right. On the bottom yeah. So you should you might look at those. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, this question actually was kind of interesting. Um, uh, there's a section in the um, latest auto grader run where we, where we basically ran your tests through our, or those that we could find through our grammar to see how much of our grammar you tested or how much of the grammar per se you tested. And um, uh, if, you, if you had, tests that were grammatically incorrect according to our parser, then um, you'd get that, you'd get these messages saying warning, uh, such and such, whatever, the, what is the warning, warning? Uh, parsing errors in test case. Yes, parsing errors in counted in test case, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that means your compiler apparently might, handles them or may handle them, but ours doesn't. So you might look at those to see whether you think there might be something wrong. Our, our compiler perhaps does some, some checks of, uh, for invalid Python programs. or It does certain things. For example, um, native, the native statement is only supposed to appear as the single statement of a uh, def. And if, uh, I've noticed some people were putting it in random places. Uh, so um, that might cause an error, for example. OK, let's uh, turn to this thing. Now, there, is this, uh, there are various implementations of Prolog. Uh, this one is, I should say, by the way, there was a great deal of interest in Prolog back at the time of, uh, uh, what was it, the, um, the nth generation thing, when, when AI was big and, and Japan was very much into artificial intelligence. There was a lot of Prolog work, including works on par work on parallel program, parallel Prolog. Um, so this is a uh, SWI prologue um, from uh, University of Amsterdam uh, that I believe is installed. I'll have to go back and make sure that I still have it installed on the instructional machines. Swipple, um, you, can, you can also get it. And here is a very, very simple example of a prologue uh, program up here at the top. Just a moment here, make sure that, yes, yeah, you can see that. So up there at the top is a very simple example of a prologue program. It says that the concatenation of the empty list with anything y is y. That's just a fact. So that means that for any y, any substitution of y, the concatenation of, uh, for any, I'm sorry, for any substitution of a list y, uh, the concatenation of the, of the list with y is y. Um, OK, that's fine. Uh, next, um, the next line there says that if I concatenate a list that starts with, um, that starts with whose head is A and whose tail is B, right, a list whose head is A and whose tail is B, if I concatenate that to Y, 
Then I get the list whose head is A and whose, he and whose tail is Z, where Z is the result of concatenating um, uh, B with, with uh, Y. So, I, so in other words, it, if you look at it, it makes sense. I mean, I take B and Y, I concatenate them, I get Z, and then, um, then I put A at the front of that, and I get the concatenation of, of A, B, and Y. So those are the two rules. And you'll notice that I've now covered all of the cases. I've covered the case where we have an empty list. I've covered the case where I have a list that has at least one element in it. So you have base case at the top and then the uh, recursive case. And uh, you can see the style here is that we don't use functions in the, pro in the prologue program. We use relations. In other words, a relation, that is to say, is, is something that um, you think of it as being, uh, uh, I, I take a number of inputs and outputs, and I ask, is this a correct output for those inputs? And the answer is, is true or false. But I ask it in a kind of a useful way. Now, let's go down and, and take, let's go down, I said, and take a look at some of the, uh, some of the things that we have here. Yes, thank you. Okay, now um, if we, hang on, I can see that this is going to cause problems, so let me just get rid of this. Okay, now if we go down here to the end, ah, sorry, I knew there was something wrong here. So if we go back up to the top here, uh, just for, as a practical note, by uh, entering this command here, this special command, I, uh, I have consulted, that is, I have loaded this file, concat.pl. Um, so now I, can, now I can use that predicate. It's now defined for me. So let's just take an example. It's supposed to, since this is, is in effect a predicate that tells me whether I've put in a true statement, let's just try this. One and two, three and four, and let's ask if that is, that's supposed to be the list one, two, three, four. Let's just make sure that it is. So we put that in there, end it with a, per, a period, very Englishy there, and it tells us true. That's true. Uh, sorry, the window we, we set, you have to look down at the bottom. So that's true, that's good. Um, now we can go a little further than that. Let's well wait. Let's just check to make sure that it, it doesn't uh, give us the wrong answer ever. So if I change, if I get rid of the three here and the two, if I say just one four, is that true? It tells me no. All right. So now I can I can go a little bit further that I can that I can ask what happens if I um, concatenate one one two with three four. Is there a list that, can, that corresponds to the concatenation of 1, 2, and 3, 4? This is the equivalent of an ordinary function call. So the way I do that is I ask, is there a very, can, there, can you find a replacement for x that causes x to be the concatenation of 1, 2, 3, and 4? And the system comes back with yes. If you let x be 1, 2, 3, 4, then it is the concatenation of 1, 2, and 3, 4. Okay, so, so far what we've done is reconstruct with a different notation something that you're familiar with, namely functions that take lists and return lists. But at this point, things begin to get weird. Suppose that I say, instead, I ask, is there an x such that when I concatenate 1, 2, two, one, two to it, I get 1, 2, 3, 4? And the system says, yes, if you give me the list 3, 4, and you concatenate that, if you can concatenate 1, 2 in the front, I will get 1, 2, 3, 4. Yes? Well, can you give it uh, like X and Y? And <laughs> patience, grasshopper, patience, we're getting there. Okay, now if I... If I ask, uh, if I ask, how about if I give it x here and I give it um, three four here? Will that work? Three four and whoops, three comma four. You've got an extra open bracket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. 
Um, is that going to work? And the answer to that question is yes, it works. It gives me one and two. And now it also offers to try to find more answers for me for some reason in this case, but it doesn't. So one and two is the answer. Now, uh, so let's see. How about this one? X, Y, one, two, three, four as you asked. It says yes, we can find, we can let x be the empty, x, empty list and then y can be 1, 2, 3, 4 and that works. Suppose I'm not satisfied, semicolon means I'm not satisfied, try again. It says yes, x can be 1 and y can be 2, 3, 4. x can be 1, 2 and in fact it finds all of the possible answers and then it and then it ends, which is kind of neat. Um, so how about, uh, let me see, I don't know if, does this work? I can't remember. Now what happens when we do this? Well, it finds an answer. That's certainly an answer. Now it makes up something. It says, okay, uh, you can give me, uh, now notice that this is a variable that it's made up. It's an, it starts with an underscore, so it's a variable. That means you can give me anything. I can, X can be a, a one element list containing anything, and then Y will be the list containing that and three, four, which is certainly true, certainly true. And we can just keep doing this, and it will keep giving me answers forever. Okay, so um, so there you have Prolog. So there's our tool for you. It's a so this is a notation that allows me to describe um, describe things by a curious coincidence. These clauses up here, these things with the um, with the uh, hypothesis turnstile um, consequent or uh, not hypothesis consequent turnstile hypotheses. They are called horn clauses. No relation. Just to be rather confusing. Uh, they are called horn clauses. They're, I, they're named after somebody, Professor Horn, I gather, uh, who used them. Uh, they're, they were originally, they're just one of these things from logic that, that the uh, prolog people plucked out of uh, thin air. Um, they have the property that it's, it's basically an implication, A and B and C implies D, where none of the A's are, um, uh, where none of the A's are negated. None, none of the terms are negated, so there are no negations in here. Um, all right, so uh, we'll, we'll carry on, on uh, with this on Monday. Uh, in the meantime, this is or will be or should be available on the instructional machines for you to play around with. <laughs>